Well, good morning. My name is Dudley Ty. I'm the youth director here at Perdido Bay United Methodist Church, and welcome to our Palm Sunday celebration. It's so good to have you with us. You have a few minutes to send somebody a text and ask them to, the, to tune in. But let's just open up with a word of prayer, and then I want to invite you to worship with us. Father, we come before you, and we're mindful that your word says that you loved us so much that you sent your son. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for changing us. Thank you for walking with us in these unusual days. We know that your hand of protection is upon us. So, Lord, we just want to praise your name lift you high. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, sing Praise is Rising. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Amen. God, we welcome you right here in this place, in our homes. We lift your name on high. for that new start this morning. You know, I know that we're not in the same room. We're not in the same place. We can't greet one another by a handshake. 
but I want to ask you to do something a little different this morning. I want to ask you maybe to pick up your phone, send someone a text, send a message, and send them a blessing this morning in the name of the Lord. Pass the peace over a text this morning as we continue to lift his name. I hope you enjoy being able to share the peace of Christ with a family member or a loved one through a text message to let them know you're thinking about them as we worship the living God together. We welcome those who are members of Perdido Bay United Methodist Church and those who are joining us for the very first time in this time of praise and worship of Jesus Christ. In this time, we are so grateful that we have the opportunity to go before God to take to God all of those things which we hold on our hearts, especially in these difficult times. We invite you to stay tuned to our Bay Planner, to our Facebook page for upcoming announcements about Holy Week services, such as Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. We will be communicating with you those details as they come along because we know that you desire, just as we do, to have a wonderful time of worship to make Holy Week a meaningful experience, even as we are going through a difficult and un uncertain season of what Holy Week will look like in 2020. But wherever you are, I invite you to go with me and to enter into a time of posture of prayer to our Heavenly Father. May we pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, we ask that you will be with us, with our families, with our friends, with our loved ones, with our community, with our country, with the world as we wrestle with how to deal with this pandemic. God, give us wisdom to heed the advice of those who are experts in this field. God, bring healing to those who are sick. Bring comfort to the families of those who have passed away. And God, for those who are in the healthcare field, may you give them a hedge of protection. May each of us do our part, oh God, to contribute to the greater good that we might see, God, that as we do this, we are loving you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and truly and meaningfully and physically loving our neighbor as ourself. God, for the fears, the anxieties that we carry on our hearts, oh God, we cast them at the foot of your cross, asking that you will give us obedience, that we will trust you fully, God, to lead us through this valley to the mountaintop that we know you promise. To know, God, that in all things you are present, in all things you are still God. We claim the power of resurrection even in the midst of darkness. God, may we, as your holy church, be people of salt and light. God, bringing hope to the hopeless, peace to the restless, healing to the sick. Lord Christ, be with us in our homes. May we know your peace, which passes all understanding, and your grace and your mercies, which are new every morning. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Today is Palm Sunday, and I wanted to tell the story of why we celebrate using palms. And it's because 
because when Jesus made his triumphal entry back into Jerusalem, all of the people lined the streets and they laid down their clothes and they said, <laughs> Hosanna the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what did they do? They were so loud, right? Right. Were they, were they yelling and screaming? Yay! They were so excited to see who? Jesus. Jesus, yes. And you know, the people who were in charge of that city kind of got upset. And um, they were making such a loud noise oh. that the Pharisees told Jesus, hey, you need to make your people get quiet, okay? <laughs> and he said, if the people are quiet, the rocks will cry out. Can you even imagine rocks crying out? Yeah! <laughs> no. Well, that would be crazy. But what might the rocks say? Maybe one rock would tell about a little shepherd boy who was able to kill a giant because God was with him with just one stone. And maybe another rock would tell about how Elijah built an altar to offer a sacrifice out of rocks. And that proved that there was just one true God, right? Another rock might have been to tell about uh, when Solomon was building a temple. And that was to worship God. And Jesus told a story one time. Do you remember the story about the wise man who built his house on a rock? That was a good story. And when the rains came down and the floods came up, what happened to his house? It went flat. No, that was the one on the sand. What happened to the one that was built on a rock? A stone. It was firm. It stood firm, yes. And so the, even though the rocks might have a lot of good stories to tell and they might want to praise Jesus' name, we're not going to let them because just like when the people lined the streets and they made a lot of noise and they were praising Jesus, we are here today and starting our Holy Week off ready to praise Jesus' name and say, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Happy Holy Week. Good morning. My name is David and I'm one of the pastors here. I want to thank uh, Hannah for that wonderful children's moment. Hannah is our excellent uh, director of children's ministry. I do want to bring to your attention that because of the recent uh, order from Ron DeSantis, the governor of the state of Florida, that came out on Thursday, we are not able to have our drive-in worship service that we had planned to have later today at 11 a.m. We are sorry about that. It, it also uh, interferes with the plans that we had in place for drive-up worship for Holy Week, the rest of uh, this Holy Week. All of our services will be experienced through Facebook Live and available on our YouTube channel and through our website. So we hope that you will join us on Monday, Thursday, and on Good Friday for those worship experiences. You can join throughout the day after uh, they've been posted at the noon hour on both of those days. And then join us on Easter for our live celebration at 9 a.m. of the resurrection and watch it anytime you'd like. We are, again, very disappointed that we can't be together, but we want to do all that we can to follow the state ordinances and the laws so that we might continue to flatten the curve and help people stay healthy and well and truly be able to take part in a resurrection experience as we beseech Christ to continue to heal this world, our community, and our nation. Today's Palm Sunday reading comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. We are, of course, in a sermon series on the Gospel of Luke for the least, the last, and the lost. And so we are using the Palm Sunday reading today from the Gospel of Luke. Would you please stand for the reading of the Gospel? After he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. 
When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And they were untying the colt. Its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power he had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we're changing everything these days, aren't we? I mean, not only is uh, the whole world different because we have this stay-at-home order now for our protection and out of a sense of compassion for our community and persons who are especially at risk of receiving this virus, we also uh, just are learning new ways of doing all kinds of things. Elizabeth and I tried out a new experience several weeks ago now when uh, all of this began to be a new reality for us, we went online and did our first Walmart pickup. Elizabeth actually was in charge of it. I don't know if you know about this experience. You go on to a website and you select all these different things that you would like for someone at Walmart to uh, collect for you. And then they bring it to your car. You just pull right up and, and you park in front of uh, slot number 132 and they bring out uh, your groceries eventually. Well, this being our first time, and I know many of you have been doing this for years, uh, she selected seven next to the word bananas because she thought, you know, it'd be nice to have seven bananas for the four of us. We might eat a banana every other day. We got 57 bananas. And not because she accidentally put five in front of the seven. No, because the shopper thought we wanted seven bunches of banana. Holly, will you show that picture? You see that there? That is a lot of bananas. And you can tell they're already somewhat ripe. I mean, this was the day we got them. I've been eating two or three bananas every day since this order before we finally looked at each other and said, we're going to have to start freezing bananas because there's only so much you can do with a banana. We're all going bananas at our house. I think sometimes when we pick up the Gospel of Luke and we read the story of Palm Sunday, a lot gets lost in translation. We may see or hear seven bananas and someone else may be seeing or hearing 57 bananas. I wonder if we really, when we read this story, know what it means to take part in Palm Sunday. So much of the reason why I love Holy Week is a little bit lost this particular Holy Week. Because we can't actually reenact Palm Sunday. If you've been around me these last three years, you know I love to reenact the story. To, to give the children a chance to see it and our adults who stay for the Sunday school hour a chance to watch kids explore the actual story because I believe the story's real power is best translated, best understood, best interpreted when we actually step into it and take part. I like handing out the little palm crosses and waving the palm branches as we enter into worship so that we might experience again what it's like to have a real Holy Week in our own lives. Several years ago, I remember standing on the Mount of Olives and I was looking southwest into the old city of Jerusalem. It was surrounded by that great wall and the Kidron Valley and all the little villages that are protecting it from all these different spots. And I thought of Jesus. And that time he must have stood there 
thinking about what was going to happen, reflecting upon what would be his reality as he entered that fateful and holy city on the hill. Uh, Many scholars believe that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, all that really could have been seen was the Temple Mount. Of course, because he lived in a time where there were no electric lights, but the Temple Mount would have been filled with candle flame. There was no electric sound. But Jerusalem would have been loud, a buzz with the sounds of collective humanity, Because scholars think that since it was the Passover, roughly 2 million persons would have gathered 2,000 years ago in that ancient city of Jerusalem to come from all over the world to celebrate the Passover festival and the feast together. Jesus, from a town of 200 people, Nazareth, is now face to face with 2 million people. And his disciples, they're all from little fishing colonies. And they are gathered there at the hub of culture. What power Jesus must have had to attract the disciples' attention away from this busy, bustling city and upon him, a man riding on a donkey. As they watch their Lord and Savior enter into Jerusalem, I imagine they must have thought in their own hearts, he's here for me. He's here to save me. So they made waves of their palm branches. They got his attention. They called on Christ who would call on them right there in the middle of Passover preparations in the great city of Jerusalem. They made a triumphant entry possible as they shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, peace and glory in the highest heaven. Are you getting equally excited? I know you're at home right now or uh, in your study or in your living room. Maybe you're even uh, making brunch. I, I, I don't know what people do when they listen to services online. But are you as excited as these first disciples? about this first day of Holy Week, welcoming Christ in. I think that the story that we read today, Palm Sunday, is much more than just Jesus's entrance into a city. In fact, I think even 2,000 years ago, as it was actually taking place, Jesus knew this is much more than just a story of me entering into this very important city for sure. I think it is also a story of how Jesus Christ hopes to make entry or re-entry into our own lives. How he is standing at the gate of your life right now, at the doorway of your heart, even now as you listen to these words or watch me on your computer screen. Christ is waiting, waiting to make an entry into your life. But you see, you got to want it. You've got to come to the parade with a deep need for what Christ brings, with a desire for his lordship and his salvation, to know that you are dependent upon Christ for joy and for hope and for life and for love. You see, Jesus is on the donkey right now, friends. And he will turn that donkey of transformative love directly towards your heart and your soul and your mind if you are willing. The promise of Christ is that he will always come if you ask. He always wants to enter into the heart of every person. Whether you are already a believer or not, Jesus wants to make a re-entrance or a first entrance into your very life, but you have to want it. He's there knocking. We call this in the Wesleyan uh, tradition in the Methodist church, provenient grace. God is waiting at every heart's door for all of us to be awakened to his love and, and to understand in our minds and in our souls that we are in need of God's love. And then if we are repentant, if we desire him to come in and and to somehow become our savior, our king, our Lord, then he will. He will enter in. But we have to be ready for what comes next. 
Many of you have heard the invitation from a preacher before to let Christ into your heart, to accept him as your savior, to open up the the gates of your soul and your mind and your life and to let Christ come in. But what happens right after he does that? What's next? Well, we're studying Luke right now. Luke's gospel tells us in verses 41 and 42, right after they're shouting their hosannas, this is what it says. Jesus came near and saw the city and he wept over it. He said, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Jesus weeps because there are so many who cannot see, who do not see. He pours out tears for the ones who are not opening up their eyes to the fact that God has made visitation with them. Jesus is coming into the city, but so many people are unable to recognize that he really is the Savior, the Lord, the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace. And and I think that if Palm Sunday, if his entrance into that city is about his entrance into our lives or him being uh, re-entering into our lives again this Holy Week, this year in 2020, then we have to recognize that the first thing he does when he comes back into our lives, if you've decided today again to give entrance to Christ over your life and your heart, he will weep for all that is within you that still has not accepted him as Lord. And all of us have impurities. All of us are not fully of the spirit and have works of the flesh still going on in our lives. All of us have within us sin. You know, sin is just anything that keeps us separated from God or separates us from God. Many of us suffer from this separation of God and his peace. And Christ brings a a healing that starts like a tear. What in your life right now, in your actions, in your heart, in your thoughts, would cause Christ to weep? Because he knows it has kept you lost in sin rather than found in God's blessing. This Holy Week, I invite you to experience your own leastness, lastness, and lostness. We've been studying the gospel of Luke, and I hope that you have heard the challenge of how can you, a disciple of Christ, continue to be in ministry with the least, the last, and the lost, as Christ has called us to love radically the least, the last, and the lost. But also tonight, I hope that you can hear yourself as least, last, and lost in this text, because all of us still are in some way, and maybe in many ways. There are things over our lives Christ right now would weep. And so what advantage is it really if we see him, if we get excited, if we welcome him into our hearts, if we still remain blind and deaf to his transformative power? We want Christ to come into our lives, but we must realize that when he comes in, he comes in ready to make a change, to give us a contrite heart and a desire to be renewed. When Christ enters into our lives, the first thing he does is he helps us identify that which still must die. He helps us see the sin that we must reject. You see, God in Christ is our judge. And this is good news. So many people hear Jesus as judge as somehow a a, a statement of fear but we should not be afraid that Christ has come to judge our lives. We need a Messiah. We need a Savior. We need a searchlight that will enter into our bodies and our minds and our souls and highlight all the darkness therein. We need the light of the world to face our darkest demons and our deepest struggles and our greatest evils head on and to say, hey, friend, this, this is what keeps you from the peace of God. This is what makes God cry because this sin in your life is still keeping you separate. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I think the message of Palm Sunday is so simple and yet I make it so complicated. It's hard even now to wrap my human mind around and it is simply this, Christ will judge the secrets of my heart 
and will weep over my sin. That's what he does after he makes that entrance into the city, into your life. He judges the secrets of your life, the sins of your life, and it causes God to weep. I think that one of our biggest deterrents to truly understanding the glorious workings of Christ is that we oftentimes don't recognize that we all are in need of a bath. We need to be cleansed. I have washed my hands more the past three weeks than I care to ever wash them the rest of my life. But we're dirty, and we need much more than hand sanitizer and 20 seconds at a sink with soap. We need the work of Christ, our judge, to cry and to show us and to highlight for us our iniquity because it keeps us lost from the true blessings of God. The other day, Joseph and Grace and I walked down to the intercoastal waterway, and he had this little toy that he was floating out into the water, but we weren't really dressed to go into the water yet, and it was still, it was kind of a cool day, and uh, I didn't want him to get soaking wet chasing after this little toy, and then we have to walk all the way back to the house. It was, we were a good bit away from our home, and so uh, I, I simply took a rock and I threw it, you know, just past the little toy so that it would land in the water. And he looked back at me with these eyes like, why are you shooting a bomb at my boat? Because I really had kind of shot one right across the bow. Well, of course, what I was doing was trying to make that rock land just on the other side of the boat so that the ripple effect created by the rock and its splash would start to send the boat back to the shore. Well, it worked. He thought it was kind of clever after it started to work. At first, he thought I was trying to shoot his boat, blow it up in the water. I mean, he is a five-year-old little boy, and that's what it felt like. I was throwing a rock at his toy. Sometimes I wonder in my own life if Christ isn't shooting a couple across the bow, bringing to my attention that which really needs to help wash me back to the shore of God's love. When I think about Christ weeping over my sin, it's a real blow. But I know that he is crying over my sin to get my attention, to shake me up, to wake me and move me and help me understand that if I want God in my life, he only comes as a change-making God. Do you know what happens next in the Gospel of Luke? The next verse is 45 and 46. Then he entered the temple and he began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. He cleanses the temple. This is a famous scene. In other gospels, he uses a whip to drive out the sellers. Have you ever put these pieces together? Right after he enters the city, he then weeps over the city, and then he goes to the temple mount, and he cleanses the temple and drives out all the evil that is there. You know, I think sometimes we really do believe these stories are for someone else, maybe the Jews 2,000 years ago, or for the Pharisees, or for the people who just happen to be in the city, but they are not. They are prophecies for us today. They are telling our own story, our own lives. If you want Jesus in your heart, if you are going to let him make re-entrance into your life today, friends, he comes not only crying over your sin, but he comes triumphantly. He comes ready to drive out all the evil, to cleanse us of all our sin and our iniquity. He looks around and he sees all the things that keep me from the peace of God. And he wants to take a whip to those things, to remove them from my life and my soul. As you've heard me say many times before, if you've been in ministry with me, you know that I, I love to preach how much we love a Savior but how much of us really want or love a Lord? We can't get just the Savior. If we want Christ to save our souls, he's also coming as our triumphant Lord, ready to take control of our lives, to show us the way. It is no longer your way. 
that will lead this life you have. It is no longer your truth or your life. It is Jesus's way, his truth and his life that takes control. And he will be the prince of peace. He will make the change. He will drive out all the darkness of our greed and self-centeredness. He will whip away all that is lustful and all that keeps us from knowing the goodness of God. He will take away all of our hate. He will take away all of that within us that causes pain in others. He will drive out all our impurities. He will not stand for an unholy temptation. So often in the Bible, our persons are described as temples, and we are holy temples if we are in the Lord. And if we have let Jesus Christ into our lives, he will not let us be an unholy temple. He will do the work of cleansing out all that sin. If we are ready to have our sin removed, he will cleanse us. But he will only do it if he can do it triumphantly. The triumphant entry or re-entry into your life means that he is a complete king, the total Lord of your life. And But who can't accept that? Who would turn down Jesus's offer to come into your life to cleanse you of all your sin and iniquity so that you might know the greater peace of the full blessings of being at one with God? Even the stones seem to understand. And so today, again, Christ is invited into your life. He weeps over your sin. He cleanses your soul. He transforms you. He does so much on this first day of Holy Week. The disciples also had some activity. Have you noticed how much action is attributed to them? The disciples secured the cult. The disciples placed Jesus on the cult. The disciples called him king and Lord. The disciples honored and praised him. The disciples welcomed him into the city. You have a part to play in Palm Sunday. You are the present day disciple. Your job, your task is the very same. Prepare the cult. Put Jesus on the animal. Welcome him. Praise him. Adore him. Humble yourselves before him. Name him as your Lord. Recognize him as the triumphant king over your life and be ready for him to cleanse you. He has entered into this very room wherever you may be and knocks upon your life, your heart, your mind, and he doesn't want your pity. He doesn't want your sentiment. He doesn't want a smile or polite nod. He certainly doesn't want your indifference. He wants the same thing he wanted from those disciples 2,000 years ago. He wants your fidelity. He wants your commitment. He wants your trust. He wants your open mind and your vulnerable heart turned over to his transformative love. He wants you to let him in triumphantly, to name that sin that is within you, to cleanse you of it. Most of all, he seeks us because he loves us. and He wants to transform us into the people who love God and others the way that he did making his way, his truth, and his life ours. This is how we share in Christ's passion. This is how we take part in this Holy Week. Maybe you haven't spent all of Lent working on your penitence, rejecting sin, drawing yourselves closer to the cross. But please at least spend these few days these next six as we go towards Easter, reflecting on the wondrous love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who wants to cleanse you of anything that keeps you from naming him the Lord of your life. The parade is coming. Don't miss it. The Messiah is upon his donkey. Even in these strange and unprecedented times, he is still waiting for a re-entry into your life. Will you grab your palm branch and will you wave it, shouting Hosanna, a word that means praise. You may not have a palm branch. I've I've got one here. Uh, I just happened to get to be at the church today. But let's say you don't have one at your home. You can wave your hand. Stand up wherever you are right now and just wave your arm like those first disciples, 
celebrating in your own heart and in your own mind, taking part in this Palm Sunday, wherever you are, in great praise and celebration that the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has come into your room and wants entrance into your life. Will you shout Hosanna? Will you shout praise and welcome him in and be ready for him to weep over your sin that still is present and cleanse you, rid you of it so that you will not be an unholy temple, but a house of prayer a house and life and heart for the love of God and the love of neighbor to reign and exist now and forever. Today is Palm Sunday. Will you take part in the triumphant entry of Christ into your life? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We're going to uh, watch a little bit of a video that has some scenes from our first two Lenten service projects, one at our redemption store and one as we made beds for children in our community who were uh, supposed to uh, be delivered those beds uh, really this week. And we know that very soon when we're allowed back into persons' homes, we will get the beds to the children in our community who are sleeping on the floor as we work with sleep in heavenly peace. As you watch this video and reflect upon the many ways in which Perdido Bay United Methodist Church is continuing to be the heart of the community and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, I encourage you to go online or to send in your regular tithe and offering or the gift that you would be making this Holy Week to the ministries of this church that we might continue to be the people of Christ standing at the parade, shouting Hosanna and joining him in his mission in this world. Thank you to each person who gave their time to come out to the Redemption Store or to the Sleep in Heavenly Peace Bed Build Day. Because of the giving of your time, the store was beautified Children without beds now have a place to sleep, and God was honored because of the giving of your generous time, talents, gifts, service, and witness. It has been wonderful to see our congregation come together to support these amazing ministries. Because of your generosity, the Redemption Store blesses people throughout our community. It provides a place for people to come and get items that otherwise would not have access to those for their home, whether it be clothes, small appliances or furniture, the Redemption Store truly does meet a tangible need in the Perdido area. Similarly, the Sleep in Heavenly Peace ministry has been a new way for us to reach out to the most vulnerable in our community. Jesus tells us that we are to care for our children, not just the children in our church, but all the children in our community. So thank you for building beds, for cleaning at the store, for sorting at the store, for giving of your time to honor Christ during the season of Lent. You know, it's a tough time right now that everyone's going through. But we're blessed that you spent your time with us this morning. We hope that service was a blessing to you. To carry it with you this week as you go. Remember, no matter what's going on in this world, God is still above all. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things. Of all wisdom and all the things of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known. Bye.
Bless you. Have a good week.